Anyways, Jordan here. We're gonna start drawing some abstract art very meticulously while listening to some relaxing music and a lecture from the book How Conversation Works. The lecture's title Time to Negotiate Professional Relationships. Saying this won't feel like an out-of-place compliment, 
but, and then you go on to do the flattery. And then third, and this may be a little bit trickier, you can express a bit of resistance before agreeing. The idea here is that then your agreement will seem all the more meaningful. An example here would be saying something like, oh, now I can see why you might want to approach it that way. After you've asked some questions, showed some skepticism. But of course, you also don't want to appear overly difficult or argumentative. You can see this is tricky territory. One other option is that you can also compliment a manager to his or her friends with the assumption that that will eventually get back to him and her. Oh, I was the manager here. Oh, Anne was saying how terrific that presentation was. If you're asking right now, why do all this? This feels like a lot of work. Studies show that people typically like others who ingratiate themselves and tend to evaluate their performance higher. In other words, for people who ingratiate themselves, a superior boss may notice their mistakes less or attribute their mistakes to causes other than that person. When people ingratiate themselves well, it makes other people feel good. It also makes it seem like this whole interaction is going to be easy, which is beneficial to both of us. As a concluding note here, the study also reports that managers with a background in law, sales, or politics are more skilled ingratiators than those with a background in, for example, engineering or finance. Now, maybe not such good news if you're in engineering or finance, but it does suggest, among other things, that sophisticated ingratiation is an acquirable skill. Having just talked about methods of ingratiating yourself, let's now turn to the interview a truly artificial conversational setting in most cases with high stakes. Now I know that many of you may be doing more interviewing at this point in your career than being interviewed, but it's helpful to think about how an interview works. In some cases, it may help you make it work better as the interviewer. It also means that you can help mentor people who are going in for interviews. Now the fact is that interviews matter. They have been shown to be a key factor in hiring decisions. It's not just how we look on paper, which I think is good. So candidates need to be doing a lot of impression management, to use a buzzword in the field. They need to promote themselves, indicate that they'd be a good fit for this particular job, and potentially ingratiate themselves. But it actually looks like ingratiation may be the least important of those three. A 1995 study of interviews by Cynthia Stevens and Amy Kristoff at the University of Maryland showed that applicants tend to use more self-promotion than ingratiation, and that self-promotion and assertion of fit correlated with positive impressions in interviews. So how can an interviewee do this self-promotion well? I have to say, I can't help but think here of a relatively new word coming from Twitter, and the word is humble brag. So this is when you're bragging but you're trying to do it modestly. In interviews, this can take the form of language such as, I was truly honored to have the opportunity to do blah, 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 where that gives you this moment to talk about something you've done, but you do it with the I was honored. So there's that kind of language, but it also helps to think about the conversational dynamics of an interview. And I'll talk here about two things specifically control of the floor, and control of topics. So the conversational floor in an interview. In most conversations, there is give and take in the question asking, but not here. The expectation is that if you're being interviewed, you will be asked the questions until perhaps the end. The interview is a chance for the interviewers to get to know more about you and decide if you're what they want. So this is how it can often be more about fit than about this person ingratiating themselves. Now, it's important to remember that as part of FIT, interviewers are also trying to get a sense of your working style, and part of your working style is your conversational style. They're sitting there thinking, will you be an easy person to work with in a meeting, one-on-one? -on -one? Will you be a good manager? Can you make a good impression? And so on. So if you're being interviewed, you want this interaction to feel well, interactional, 
which means managing the conversational floor well. You will be asked a lot of questions, which hand you the conversational floor. But you don't want to go on too long. You don't want to hog that floor. You really don't want to make the interviewers interrupt you. So think about, if you're being interviewed, providing succinct answers that leave open lots of topics that they can then follow up on. This is putting interesting topics on the table. And you can end with something like, I'm happy to talk more about this, but let me stop there for now. As an interviewee, you should also always be watching for cues as to whether people are engaged. Are these people back channeling, or are they looking down at something, preparing for the next question? If a question you get asked is unclear, or you need more information, it's a good idea to ask a follow-up question. This doesn't mean you don't know what you're talking about. It actually shows engagement and indicates that you don't assume you know everything about a new context, that you're interested in this context. So that's the conversational floor. Let's now talk about control of the topic. The worst thing is to leave an interview and think, but they don't know about this thing. One solution to this is make a list of five things you want the interviewers to know before you leave that room. And then odds are that you can work them in there somewhere and you won't have that terrible feeling when you leave the room. In the end, remember that you are interviewing to work with people, to be a colleague, and so try to make this a conversation that they want to continue. Now we'll turn to a professional context where knowing how conversations work may not seem relevant, but it is. There are times in the professional world where we're asked to do a presentation. In other words, we're asked to present a monologue. Now we have all sat through presentations where people talk at us, not with us. And this is why it helps to think about dialogue, to think about conversation, and try to think through how can I recreate more of that feeling, even in a monologue. So here's the first thing. Not everyone takes the spoken context seriously enough. People don't write things that will work aloud. As a linguist, I can tell you that more formal written prose is very different from speech. For example, written prose often does a lot more with subordination. It has subordinate clauses stacked on top of each other. It's very hard to process those as a listener. Sometimes people will put those subordinate clauses up in front when they're writing, and the subject comes later. So they'll say something like, encompassing the many perspectives that I blah, 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 although blah, 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 and then we get to the subject. And as a listener, you're having so much trouble figuring out what this sentence is about. Speech needs to do more repetition. And you need to think about that when you're preparing a presentation. It needs to rely on shorter sentences and signal to people where they are in the presentation. The scenario you don't want as a presenter is that people are sitting there going, how much longer is she going to go on? I mean, are we halfway, two thirds? Then people can also forget that we learn narratively. We learn through stories, not lists. One of the problems here is that PowerPoint and other such technologies encourage lists. But the fact is that we as listeners rarely remember lists, nor are we engaged by lists. Given all of this, let's look at a presentation that is less successful at engaging the audience. This presentation will summarize the eight most striking results from our extensive surveys of hybrid owners and prospective hybrid owners conducted over the past 18 months with 15,000 consumers in 10 major cities across the U.S. All right, I'm going to pause after that first sentence. Wow, was there a lot of information packed into that first sentence. And it had no first person, no hook. Now let's return as he goes on to the next slide. Let me outline the three goals of the study. To better understand the weighting of design appearance versus full efficiency. To update the prioritized list of consumers' reasons for purchasing hybrids. And to gauge consumer opinion on engine off warning noises. Now the first result. If you look again at this list, we have a lot of abstract nouns, such as the weight of appearance or a prioritized list of consumers' reasons. This can be hard for listeners to engage with because there are no people 
acting as agents doing things. People as agents doing things would create more of a narrative. Nothing feels conversational here. We're being talked at. Instead, think about how to make your presentation more of a conversation with your listeners. How can you incorporate a story or make information more narrative? Where can you put in a question and then pause and answer it to try to recreate that kind of interaction? As with teaching, as we'll talk more about, telling people where you're going and then signposting along the way is very helpful. Think also about how you can hook people from the very beginning of the presentation to help them see what they might find interesting here. So now let's take a look at another version of the presentation that's doing more to engage the listeners. 18 months ago, we ran an extensive set of surveys of hybrid owners and prospective hybrid owners. We needed to make sure we understood the still growing market. Were the findings of 2010 still valid? As it turns out, no. Even though 2010 does not seem that long ago, and I'll get back to that. We were aiming to determine three things. First, we wanted to hear from consumers on how important the look or design of the hybrid car is compared to the mileage it can achieve. As I'll talk about, we ran surveys on what sacrifices consumers are willing to make in design for better mileage, and in mileage for a more appealing design. Second, see how much more conversational this feels. There is, for example, the we running the surveys. And then there's the rhetorical question with a teaser of a finding to come. Were findings from 2010 still valid? I think it's important to remember what I call the five minute rule. People decide whether or not a presentation is going to be interesting within the first five minutes. And much of that decision is based on the style of the presentation as much as the content. We all know that first impressions matter in all contexts, and presentations in the professional workplace are no exception. All too often, people think about teaching as more like a presentation, a monologue. But it's actually a conversation, or it should be. I spent a lot of time thinking about the conversational dynamics in a classroom. And one thing I've determined is that running a good meeting is just like good teaching. So lots of us in different contexts can learn valuable strategies from thinking about teaching. Teaching is a conversation because students are not sponges to be talked at. Not that we really talk at sponges, but you know what I mean. We know that active engagement is how we learn. And this is why students need to be actively engaged in a conversation in which they're getting to ask questions, apply information to problems, talk it out with each other and with the instructor. So how do you, as a teacher or someone running a meeting, help people talk productively in a more formal setting where they may have to do things like raise their hand and get called on? Here are three things to consider. And as I said, these hold for teaching and for running meetings. First, the five minute rule. And this is a slightly different from the five minute rule with presentations. Here, the five minute rule is that I believe that participants in a meeting or a class decide if they will be asked to participate in the first five minutes. And if they get the sense that they're not gonna have to participate at any point here, they go into passive mode, they sit back. And if 15 or 20 minutes from now, you're gonna try to rouse them from that state, you can do it, but it takes more work than if they're prepared to talk from the beginning. Second, the destination principle. Unlike an informal conversation, teaching or meeting usually has a much more explicit agenda and often much clearer time limits, or at least it should. So it is key to tell people what the agenda is. And there's a really useful analogy here about what it's like to give people the agenda or not in terms of the productivity of the meeting. It's like being in a car. If I'm driving and somebody else is sitting in the passenger seat, and we're going somewhere, they know where we're going. And they say to me, okay, you know, go straight, turn left, go up to that stop sign, turn right, go straight, turn left, look, we're here. Okay, we're here, but I have no idea how we got there and I could not recreate it. But 
if this person says, okay, and we're gonna go to this new restaurant, and it's about a half mile west of the mall, I'm like, okay, now they say, go straight, go left, up that stop sign, go right. Here we are. Now, there's a better chance that I can understand each step along the way, and I might be able to recreate it. So this really helps in meetings or teaching. If you can tell people where you're going, then they understand how each step along the way fits in, and they can participate more productively to keep things moving in that direction. Then third, the positive reinforcement effect. If you want people to participate, you need to verbally reward them for doing so. You need to say things like, that's a great question, or I hadn't thought of that, or even, that's interesting, talk me through that a bit more. I have to say, you also need to be patient with silence. If you ask a question in teaching or in a meeting, and you're greeted by a couple of seconds of silence, don't start talking again. Just sit there, sometimes people need more than two seconds. And the good thing is that in many Western cultures, people are so uncomfortable with silence that if you wait them out, eventually someone will talk just to make that silence end. So we've talked about a few different professional relationships. Interviewer, interviewee, ingratiator, ingratiatee, presenter, audience, teacher, student. We'll now turn to another very important professional relationship in almost all of our lives and that's doctor-patient. Here we've got one person in their professional environment and often the other, an outsider to that professional environment. And here we'll be talking in part about the importance of preparing if you are the outsider to this encounter. There have been a good number of studies of doctor-patient interaction. You might be asking, why so many studies of this? And the reason is that while physical symptoms are certainly important, talk is also crucial. Analysts of these interactions point out that there are very few cases where a diagnosis can be based purely on physical symptoms. Doctors need to hear what patients are experiencing and thinking, and this may take the form of stories. But we also know that doctors can sometimes be impatient with patients' stories, seeing them as somehow a waste of time. And patients may not feel empowered to tell stories. Ethnographer Catherine Young points out that when we enter a doctor's office, we can become more a body with physical symptoms, and often a body without all its clothes on, than a self with opinions and feelings. Yet we need to be a self to tell a story. So how can each of us who is not a doctor, or who is a doctor, make this conversation work as well as possible? I want to tell you about a few studies because they hold implications for those of us both as doctors and patients in terms of how to make this conversation work well. In its ideal form, a visit to a doctor is a consultation between two or more parties who respect each other's viewpoints and expertise, even if that expertise is very different. However, for many patients, it can feel more like an interview where they don't have control of the topic. For example, think even about the initial intake form, which prioritizes some things and leaves off other things and seems to set up what topics are available for discussion. Then, the conversation in the doctor's office is often set up in a hierarchical way, especially if the doctor uses a professional title and addresses the patient by his or her, her first name. So it says something like, Hello, Anne, I'm Dr. Hendricks. Now, of course, this is good in that we want to trust this person as a professional and want them set up as a professional, but it also may not make us feel very empowered in this conversation. <coughs> that said, it turns out that doctors don't always ask all the questions. In a study by Nancy Ainsworth Vaughn in the 1990s, she discovered that patients asked about 40% of the questions which might be a surprising finding to you. But this wasn't consistent across the board. It actually depended on the gender of the doctor and the patient. Patients asked the most questions with female doctors. The fewest questions happened when both the physician and the patient were male. Now this probably isn't good. Patients
patients should have questions and they should feel empowered to ask those questions no matter the gender of the doctor. We also need to think about the kind of questions that patients feel empowered to ask. To do that, let's listen in on a conversation between a doctor and a patient. I think we could repair your right ear with a simple procedure called tympanoplasty, which should restore your hearing. Now, my schedule is free in August. All right, it sounds promising. Call the front desk and set it up for August. Now, this is a routine procedure, nothing to worry about. We could do it outpatient with local anesthesia and get you all fixed up. Will there be any pain? No more than usual. We'll send you home with some really good meds that should take care of that. The nurses will explain it to you in recovery. Will I have to miss work? Two days. Three at the most. It's a routine thing. In this conversation, the patient has had a decision made for her, and she leaves without a lot of information about the actual procedure or the doctor, just reassurance and some logistics. Let's now look at a different version of this conversation where the patient is taking more control of the conversation and the decision making. I think we could repair the damage to your right ear with a simple procedure called tympanoplasty, which should restore your hearing. Now, the schedule is free in August. That sounds promising. Have you performed this surgery before? Oh, lots of times. It's a routine procedure. Were there any complications? No, it really is very straightforward. What was that again, please? A tympanoplasty, a repair of the eardrum. Thanks, tympanoplasty. Are there any alternatives to the surgery? Not really. Patching the eardrum helps keep foreign matter out of your ear and also reduces the likelihood of infection. There's also a really good chance that your hearing will be restored or improved. Well, that sounds terrific. Could you explain me exactly what we'll do? Sure. Let's go through this step by step. Here, the patient leaves with much more information and she has established a relationship with the doctor where they are both involved in the decision making. So, let me offer you a few strategies to consider if you are preparing for a visit to the doctor's office. The first is do some homework and come in with questions. If it helps for you to write those questions down, feel free to do that. It also may help if you see yourself as at least in part interviewing the doctor to see if this relationship is going to work. And then, as we talked about with the interview, if there are things that you want to make sure the doctor knows, you need to do that. And so think about those ahead of time and make sure you put them on the table. It gives you more control of the topics. As a fourth piece of advice, I would say feel free to foreground your concerns to make sure they are addressed. I found myself doing this the other day. There was something wrong with my toe, and I realized that I was actually terrified that they were going to have to amputate my toe. And so I went in and I said, now I know this is gonna sound silly, but I'm very worried that you are going to have to amputate my toe. Are you going to have to amputate my toe? At which point they could tell me that I was being silly and we could just take care of that concern. A last thing to consider is that in some of these interactions, you may need to suspend some of the politeness conventions that you might use outside the doctor's office. This is transactional, not personal. And so if you feel like you're being interrupted or you don't have control of the topic, feel free to stop and say, I'm sorry, but can I make sure that we talk about this? Effective listening is also really important here. And we're talking mostly about doctors at this point. This may seem obvious, but the emphasis that I have found in physician training suggests that it remains a problem. It isn't necessarily that the doctor isn't listening, it's sometimes about whether the patient thinks the doctor is listening. For example, doctors need to make and maintain eye contact when patients are speaking, as opposed to trying to simultaneously look at a chart or a computer when a patient is talking. They also need to send signals of listening, like nodding, and leaning forward. Doctors also need to let patients finish before moving to another topic. Let that topic die before shifting topics. Interruptions, in contrast, can make a patient feel like they haven't been heard. Here I'm going to turn to a study by Candace West from the 1980s, which is older but worth noting. 
She found that with male physicians, 67% of the interruptions were by the doctor. But with female physicians, only 34% of the interruptions were by the doctor. And she includes a fascinating quote from one male doctor. She asks him about the interruptions, and he says, well, that's because so many patients are still answering your last question when you're trying to ask them the next one. Now, there's no doubt that doctors have a set of topics they may feel they need to cover, and time constraints are a reality. But good listening, including picking up topics put on the floor by patients, seems to be imperative to effective medical care. And if you as a patient feel that you're being interrupted, you can take back control of the floor and you can use politeness strategies that we've talked about, such as, I'm sorry, but can I just finish? As Harvard surgeon Atul Gawande reminds us in his wonderful books about medicine, medicine is a very human science. Medical technology has made huge strides, but medicine is still human and talk is central to both diagnosis and treatment. In this lecture, we've talked about the importance of first impressions and of good listening in professional contexts. And these topics will come up again in the next lecture when we turn to personal relationships, from first encounters on dates to conversations in long-standing intimate relationships. We'll also talk about the power of aligning one's language with someone else's language. And that can then be extended back to the power of alignment in professional contexts.